This article and my commentary on it probably is gonna upset some of you. So hold on to your garden belts because we're gonna take a scientific look at this whole thing. Right, Cole? Let's get into it. Okay, I've gotten so many DMs about this article right here. Now, most of the commentary I've seen about this is people just reposting the screenshot, the first part of the article, which you cannot access the rest of it unless you pay. So I went ahead and bought the article to read through, break down for you guys to let you know if this is true or false. And if it is true, how we could avoid this sort of commentary about us gardeners. So let's get into it. So the article is referencing a study done by a PhD candidate student at the University of Michigan. So what they found out through this study was that conventional grown agricultural setting fruits and vegetables were typically lower in their carbon footprint compared to that of a small plot family garden that sort of thing. Now the study was comprehensive in the sense that it did look at several different gardens over their entire lifetime, which I don't know how you could look at a garden over its lifetime because my garden, for example, the core garden was here when I bought the house and the, this home has been here for, since 1968. I don't think a PhD candidate would have, you know, a long-term study like that over 40 years because sometimes gardens last forever. So I'm not too sure what that meant, but in the article doesn't, in the article doesn't really get into the description of what the lifetime of a garden means. So that I can't really comment on. However, they looked at gardens in the UK and the US and just your, your conventional classic garden setting, whether it was allotment or a plot or front yard, backyard, etc., and so forth. Now the scientists did say that the carbon output from the classic gardener compared to that of the conventional has very little to do with the vegetable themselves and more so to do with the gardening technique that's used. So things like raised beds, sheds were listed in this. Obviously tools, containers all contributed to a higher CO2 output for those more home garden based type settings. And then the other two that they did mention was excessive inputs. Now they said specifically synthetics. However, uh, they also mentioned poor compost management. So in my head, poor compost management, I mean, any sort of input that's unnecessary, organic or conventional, synthetic or, or organic, will result in a higher output of carbon dioxide because regular fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers, have to actually be biodegraded by microbes and the byproduct of that is CO2. So that is for synthetics and then obviously regular compost as well would fall under this category. So just excessive inputs will elevate your CO2. So I'm gonna read the test to you verbatim how they wrote it in here because again, I can't, and, and maybe from this sentence you can tell me what the life cycle assessment of a garden is. They looked at 73 urban agricultural sites around the world, including Europe, US, and the UK, conducted a comprehensive life cycle assessment on the site's infrastructure, irrigation, and supplies. So they don't look at the plants, they looked at irrigation, infrastructure, and supplies. Supplies meaning inputs like pesticides, organic or conventional, again, fertilizers, organic or conventional, et cetera, and so forth. Now, what they did find, and I find this part interesting, it kind of is like they're walking back the statement, <laughs> and that is in the cases of the American, the European, and the UK gardens, was that two plants specifically, and this wouldn't be limited to two plants if we actually look at the descriptor of why they chose these two plants, but two plants in specific in this article are mentioned, tomatoes and asparagus, both of which have much lower CO2 output when grown in a home garden compared, compared to that of a conventional agricultural setting. So this I find interesting. And the reason why they defined a tomato as one of those 
lower uh, CO2 outputters when grown in a garden is because tomatoes, classically speaking, are grown in a greenhouse setting. And a greenhouse setting has a very high CO2 output. You've got a lot of infrastructure, a lot of irrigation infrastructure, uh, a lot of pesticide actually uh, management, that sort of thing, and really high fertilizer inputs. Again, conventional or synthetic, or synthetic or organic, you have really high fertilizer inputs. So the tomatoes are actually one where they say grow those in your home garden because those have a lower CO2 output than that of which are grown in a conventional setting. Now, what I find interesting about the tomato comment is that they go on to say later in the article that if you wanted to reduce your CO2 output, you would actually not just select tomatoes to grow in your garden, you would select any sort of plant that would be grown in a greenhouse because anything grown in a greenhouse will have a higher CO2 output than that of which would be grown in the garden. So I'll put a list here <laughs> for North America anyways, um, to give you an idea of what you should grow in your garden if you want to lower your CO2 uh, footprint, for example. So tomatoes being one of them, I know that in many cases, cucumbers, that sort of thing are also grown in greenhouses. Where I'm in Canada, there is greenhouses all over the place because of just the difficulty in which it is to grow any sort of plant outside of the three months we can actually be outside without freezing. So uh, greenhouses are quite common here. So for Canadians, I guess you could argue gardening has a lower footprint you know, regardless because of the nature of how we have to move stuff in all the time. Which brings me to the second one, which is asparagus. So asparagus seems like a very odd commentary saying, oh, asparagus, you know, that's one of the ones where you should grow at home rather than purchasing from the store because of the CO2 footprint. And they go on to say the reason for that is because of the uh, difficulty in which it is to get asparagus into, you know, most areas. Asparagus, if you do not know, has a very limited growing period, a uh, very specific growth habit, um, hard to establish that sort of thing, but it's actually not the growing habit or the nature in which we harvest that. So the limited time frame in which asparagus is harvested that causes the problem. The problem comes from the fact that it needs to be transported after harvest so quickly uh, via air a lot of times and or trucks all over the place because it's it's very limited into where it grows it's very limited in to when it's actually available for people to get asparagus so the co2 load on that is much much higher than we we would see otherwise so that brings me into the next one so your co2 footprint is lower if you're able to find uh fruits and vegetables uh that typically are flown into your area you're, if you're able to grow those locally, which again, Canada kind of falls in that really awkward place where, yeah, we we fly in a lot of stuff right now. I'm looking at a snow bank, so not a lot grows here. So again, gardening as a Canadian, probably lower footprint. Northern US, I know you guys are very similar situations to us probably uh, a lot less damaging CO2 wise to actually grow in your garden. So I'll put a, a link or I'll put a list here of what fruits and vegetables are classically th flown in from elsewhere and ones you may wanna consider growing kind of locally in your own environment. So the messaging here, what, what can you do if you wanted to lower your CO2 footprint or you didn't wanna be categorized as a gardener who, you know, has more CO2 than that of a conventional farmer. Sometimes this stuff just, you're gonna have a little bit of a CO2 load, but I would personally lean towards most gardeners, particularly ones that watch this channel and know that excessive compost use, excessive infrastructure use, and excessive any of that, I don't advocate for none of that. I advocate for actually minimal input whenever possible and uh, doing what's right for your soil to help maximize the results, most of which you know comes around, you know, avoid piling on compost, avoid putting in too much synthetics. For the most part, you can fertilize without fertilizer as long as your soil is kind of ready to go physically or it, uh, chemically is fine. Okay, so solution one is don't use raised beds. So when I say this, I oftentimes when people send me their soil, like a, a, an image of their soil, I'll say to myself, okay, um, 
you know, the soil looks like this, we really need to build up rather than into, and in some cases it's unnecessary or it's not uh, possible to avoid the raised bed. But whenever possible, use your mineral soil. Dig into that soil, use that mineral soil. It's meant to grow plants and there's this, you know, big trend to use compost or to build on top of soil or whatever the case is, unless it's a phys like you're physically unable to get on your hands and knees and garden, for the most part, garden in ground. It's the soil's there for a reason, so use it as such. So that's number one. Now say you couldn't get away from the raised bed situ situation. Say you did send me a DM and I said, listen, <laughs> we can't work with that we got to build upwards and i have said that in some cases or physically you're unable to you know bend down maybe you have some sort of disability mobility issues then you want to build up and when you build up you want to choose materials that last a long time and or are easy to repair so say you did a raised bed garden using the galvanized steel so i've you know, I use the steel beds. I got another big steel bed I'm actually excited to set up here this year. It's a new brand that I'm trying out. And I mean, ultimately speaking, those steel beds, I last ages. I've had my sprout garden one for two years now. It sits in a snowbank. Uh, it's been through two Canadian winters. There's no sign of rust. There's no sign of bending or warping or, you know, bowing out any of that i don't see me replacing those galvanized steel beds i have very cheap princess auto ones in the front yard that my husband bought me those have been through three canadian winters again completely fine no signs of rust warping or any of that and so maybe going for a steel setup rather than a wood setup would reduce your co2 footprint and that is what this article says to do as well if you went for wood go for you know thick enough beams or go for something that is a little bit less you know predisposed to rot or something that can be easily repaired in the event that it does rot rather than doing one solid board maybe do sections so that certain sections can be replaced rather than the entire length of that raised bed but those are two definite hints or tricks you could use if you want to reduce your co2 footprint for your garden because again the main part of this article was infrastructure being the problem area. Next is don't overapply fertilizers. I say this all the time, but I will say it again. Uh, that includes organics and conventionals. So if you're not soil testing, which I don't advocate for doing crazy soil testing, I, I advocate for very basic soil testing whenever possible, meaning at home DIY kit type soil testing. If you aren't showing fertilizer problems, don't fertilizer or don't fertilize. If you are showing fertilizer issues, then consider adding on a modest amount rather than an excessive amount. Uh, fertilizer, synthetic or conventional, when added in excess, the microbes just kind of use the rest of it. Um, use the, this is cool, hi, hello. They will uh, tend to utilize, uh, you know, and decompose that, releasing more CO2, that sort of thing. And then there's leaching, volatilization, that sort of stuff that we see when we put on excess. So always do stuff within reason. Number four would be actually to grow the plants that I had listed in excess. So planting more of those ultimately would offset you growing stuff that normally has a lower footprint uh, when grown conventionally and ultimately will just reduce your CO2 footprint, um, whether you're storing or whatever the case is. So you could actually offset that by planting something that usually in a conventional setting is higher in CO2 output. So for example, tomatoes and asparagus <laughs> or whatever it may be for your country. So that is my tips for reducing your CO2. That is my commentary on this article. Ultimately speaking, um, I don't know. It's talking about uh, basically the hobby being CO2 intensive, but I would argue hobby wise, it's probably the lowest CO2 intensive compared to most hobbies out there. And I might be wrong, but that's my feelings on the case. Um, and I guess for me, I don't, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about it. I think that this is more just like an article to get you excited, <laughs> which most articles, that's what, what they do. Um, yeah.
Just it's, it was the infrastructure. It was the main the main CO two thing for them. So, anyways, thanks for watching. Comment, subscribe, comment down below what you think of this article. If you have read it, if you didn't, or what you think of my commentary on it, I'd love to hear. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.